from Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a safety prerogative, this is the source of information on psychological injury prevention and health promotion. Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joel Mitchell. How are you, Joel? Well, I'm adjusting to having Jason back in the office. We had a week with no Jason in the office and it was, Sounds amazing. It was magnificent. <laughs> we were so productive. We were so appropriate. Yeah. It was just, um, uh, it was magic. I believe the product productive bit appropriate with you in the office you you weren't here you don't know you're gonna have to take my word for it (laughs) uh yeah hey um actually that that actually is a good uh segue into uh, a question i had for you so some people think that we kind of ham it up a bit or like we play up a bit on the podcast this is nothing (laughs) this is like not even 50 percent yeah, I'd have to agree with that. If anything, I'd say it's maybe 25, 30%. Yeah, no, it's um, yeah, this is this is low key. Yeah. Pe- so, well, people think that and then like they actually see us in person or like get on a just a one-on-one call with us and they're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's it, right? <laughs> so they think we put on a persona for the podcast. If anything, we dull down our persona. We do. Yeah, I think. We, well, we don't. We don't want to get cancelled. We talked about that. We would get yeah. cancelled if we were our true if selves. We were legit, and we'd have to put E on all of that. We'd have to tick the explicit <laughs> box on all of the podcasts. And that's just for you. Yeah, you, you've got more of a potty Mine, mouth. Than you're, me. All right, I'm yeah. worse than you, but yeah. it's it's a slim margin. <laughs> don't don't tarnish me with the same I, brushes. You. I probably say some words that are maybe a little bit worse than the words that you use. But for comedic effect from such a small person as yeah, yourself, yeah. it's actually hilarious. I know. That's why I do it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Context is key for humor. And uh, you drop an F's and C's, not so much the C's. So. I, I do. I drop the odd C bomb when it's, um again, for comedic purposes, yeah. not, not uh, directed at anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But you have to see it. But we're definitely not dropping those sort of words on no. this podcast. No, we'll leave no. that for our after dark. Um, that we keep threatening to do. We, we will do it one day, I reckon. Maybe just do one you reckon? I don't reckon Dan would let us. Probably not. Yeah, we'll keep working on Dan on that one. Uh, listeners, if you want us to hear us do an after dark where uh, we have a few drinks and then uh, do a podcast <laughs> and be a little bit more inappropriate <laughs> and, and hear the full, full selves, yeah, 100%, yeah, not the 25. The, uh, the unfiltered. Yeah, write to daniel at peoplediagnostics.com.au and say, we need to hear this. Yes, a write-in campaign. That's what we need. (laughs) (laughs) Over to you, listeners. Yeah, okay. Well, on that note, we uh, should probably introduce our guest. Yes, this will be a a very different um, podcast than uh, than usual. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So um, he is an advocate for men's mental health. Uh, author of the recently published book, The Scented Tradie, not The Scented Tree, as uh, I Jason thought. Jason just grossly misheard me when I was t- telling him about this book, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was like one of those uh, air fresheners, you hang on your uh, review mirror. But no, no, no. Scent- Scented Tradie tra- or tradesman or contractor for our international audience. Yes. Uh, and owner of Laser Plumbing Caring Bar. Welcome to the podcast, Daniel Gabler. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm sure you can bring your potty mouths on a building site one day if you wanted to. Joelle would fit in so well. You have no idea. <laughs> well, you know, I've had most of my career in like mining and construction and petroleum, so you got to, especially when you look like me. Uh, I reckon she'd make a lot of your colleagues blush. I can do that. I've made plenty of colleagues <laughs> blush in the past, so. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll fit. <laughs> Looking forward to this conversation, mate. But we'll uh, we'll leave the F's and C's for off air. I think yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or or that after dark special after, business. Yeah, yeah, right into Daniel. Daniel at pdx.com.au. Mm. Um, Dan, what podcast do you like to listen to? I'm I'm on a bit of a I'm attached to one at the moment. Uh, Sarah Grimberg's um, Life of Greatness. I got sent uh, an episode of hers by a mate and. She interviewed a guy named Ephraim Finch. Um, he's very big in the Jewish community. I recommend anyone listens to this one. Um, he talks about life and death. He's a 
he, he worked in Jewish mortuaries. I don't know exactly the term that he uses, but um, to have his perspective on life and death, I, the 45 minute conversation they had changed my life. And so, yeah, I've listened to a bit of her stuff at, at the moment, which is, which is great. And then yeah, audio books are my big thing off the back of that as well. Yeah. It's nice to um, find a new podcast with a big backlog that you can just like binge. I, um, I enjoy that. Yeah. This one's like just that particular episode is life changing. I don't know. I had a mate of mine, he walked the dog um, and he ended up in a street that he never even been in, in his life. And he didn't know how far he was from his house. It's had that kind of effect on him. So yeah, I, I challenged the listeners to really go on and have a look at that one. Yeah. What was the name of that one again? I'm going to write that down. Life of Greatness. Okay. Yeah. And the particular episode I'm talking about is Ephraim Finch. Okay, cool. I'm listening to that on the way home today. I'm looking for a well, new podcast. By the sounds of it, if you do, you might end up running in the back of the car in front of you. So maybe Just do it when you're not be, having to multitask. Be prepared. You will cry. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, yeah, I'm pretty soft when it comes to those sort of things. <laughs> I will, I'll take the risk. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, I think you should actually just run yourself a bubble bath and um, and listen to it then <laughs> with a glass of Chardonnay. <laughs> not me listening. <laughs> that's, a, that's a slippery slope. <laughs> this, is, this is funny um, only if you know Jason because you know how uncharacteristic that is. Um, so sorry. Sorry for that um, inside joke, everybody. Yeah. Um, Dan, tell us about your professional career, please. Professional career. I started my business very early. Uh, so I started a business at 22 years of age, um, which is, you know, you're a fantastic uh, contractor, I guess you want to call it for your international wheels, but, you know, you're a fantastic technician. Um, and it's sort of one thing leads to another and you start your plumbing business, but you have absolutely no idea about business. So it has been a, a rocky road to get me to the point where I am now, you know, the introduction of employees very early on. Um, now I'm running a team of 16 with a couple of girls in the office. So it, it's very much a well-established business with some great clients um, and, and a really long pipeline of work, which is absolutely fantastic. And unfortunately I've had to learn the hard way through and making some serious financial mistakes, but I guess that's the basis for a lot of uh, contracting businesses, right? Yeah, so that um, I think that that's a um, probably a common story for a lot of um, you know people, especially very skilled trades people. They'll find themselves either promoted sort of internally to a management position if they're in a, a big company, or yeah, going into that um, sort of business and ownership. But then it's a completely different um, skill set um, and knowledge base that you need to actually be able to do that successfully. Well, it's your next apprenticeship, right? So yeah, you've you've learned your trade, but you don't know anything about business and it's just sort of blind ambition gets you to where you need to go. But eventually you get to the stage where um, I think everyone needs a, a mentor or a coach at some time in their life. And yeah, you put, you need to put your uh, hand up and, and go and get that help. And that's just been an absolute game changer in my life. So since around the age of 25, 26, the business has just gone strength to strength to strength. And um Part of that is obviously allowing people into your business and and giving them some responsibilities and systems and processes and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, we got to where we are now. Fantastic. Yeah, I'd imagine uh, it's a big jump, right? Going from you know an apprentice into your your trade, uh, where there is a lot of mentoring and support, right, from more senior, experienced um, colleagues. Um, but when you want to go out on your own, you don't get as much support from people in the trade because then you're seen as a potential competitor, right? Yeah, that's, that's a real funny one. Like, as you said, you sort of, you've shown your craft, but you're never involved in the back end side mm. of the business. So you don't know how to quote, invoice, do all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's very cloak and dagger. It's quite weird. Whereas with my business now, I'm, I show the guys everything, the numbers of the business, how to quote, because it's actually benefiting me. Um, I think that's a very old school way and I'm hoping things are changing, not just in my business, but the greater, because the more involvement you get from you guys, the better buy-in, the better product you have for your client, right? Yeah. Oh, and there's also the, uh, we were just talking about this at lunchtime, the, um, the hit by the bus risk. Um, so you need somebody who actually understands 
what's going on in the business to keep it running if you're uh, out of commission for a little while? Yeah, well, like recently I went on a holiday, first family holiday in three years, obviously COVID and whatever, but we had a baby and first family holiday in three years, we went away and I can confidently say, you know, like the girls in the office handled it, the guys out on the road handled it. And it was to a point where I had a meeting with them before I left and they said, Dan, just leave it, we got it. And that's such a nice feeling to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah we, no. we had a similar conversation <laughs> with you over the Christmas break, didn't we, Jason? Yeah, that's right. They're like, Jason, we got this. Yeah. I, I didn't quite trust you. I still checked No, you my, did. Uh, you, well, you kept calling us all the time and we yeah, basically just, had just, to tell you to cool it. Just missed you. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's business ownership, right? I don't know. It's like you just care about your baby so much. Yeah, that's right. Um, but it reminds me of that quote around, um, you know, CFO says to the CEO, you know, um, what happens if we train people up? And then they leave us. And then the CEO is like, what if we don't train them up and they stay? <laughs> you know, so it's uh, I think it's actually better to share it, right? And then you keep people by how you look after them and the culture that you, you build rather than seeing them as potential competitors. Yeah, well, like my my first apprenticeship boss, um, him and I still send work orders to each other. We're similar size business now, which is really awesome. We work in together. You know, over Christmas, if his guys aren't on call, my guys will do it or vice versa. And my second apprenticeship boss, who I did most of my time with, um, we're really great mates and he's still a one-man band. So he relies on my business from time to time to provide labour and materials or whatever it might be. So I don't think ever burning a bridge is a good idea. I've had guys that have left me to go out subby um, or they've gone out to start their own businesses and they've come back as subcontractors. So yeah, it's all about making sure those relationships are there and, yeah, you, you get the benefit from it. Yeah, and we see that even in a completely different industry that we're in, right? Mm. You know, every now and again, you know, we'll have someone reach out about partnership and they're like, oh, first of all, I want to make sure we're not competing. I'm like, we very rarely see competition. It's more collaboration opportunities. Like, there's always, you know, even if we're working in the same field, there's plenty of people that we collaborate regularly and, mm. and pass work off to and vice versa, so. Well, like even in the plumbing industry, people don't, really realize and they get jealous for whatever reason but it's a couple of billion dollar industry in australia yeah. like you're not even a quarter yeah. of a percent so don't worry about competition you know what i mean like there's enough work out there for all of us oh yeah um have you thought about branching out into perth um <laughs> we've got a we've got a trade shortage in perth <laughs> i think everywhere in australia is going to trade shortage at the moment which is Except the area that I live in in the Sutherland Shire, um, it's interesting. There's actually 4,000 registered plumbing businesses in a population of 250,000. So it's a southern suburb of Sydney, but obviously we have to travel to sort of peter out and make sure we find our little niches. But yeah, it's a very trade uh, dense population. Yeah, I've got a mate actually um, who's a plumber in Penrith. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's there's plenty around. Like you say, it's a it's a bloody big market, and uh, lots of lots of hands are required. So, hey, um, but really, uh, we're not trying to talk to you today about the trade shortage. Um, you've got a, you've got a book that you've uh, you've authored uh, called The Centered Tradey. Um, we'll have to put the link to the book in the show notes for yep. people because they might look up Centered Tree, um, like I thought <laughs> we were going to be talking about initially. I think that that's probably unlikely, but. Um... If that makes you feel better, then yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, but can you tell us what motivated you to write it? I mean, you're a plumber by trade, um, not an author. So what what convinced you that it would be a good idea to write a book? So I guess a bit of an interesting cat off the back of a, a real massive breakthrough in my life at 24. I went down a bit of a spiritual path as well. So I went and did a, I'm a Reiki master as well, which is pretty funny. Um and I guess it was just a, a ref reflection piece for me. I started, it was more of a journal, um, started to go back into sections of my life and I went right back into primary school and sort of all those sliding door moments and forks in the road that, you know, where that could have led me. And as I started writing, I went, this is a book and I know that there's a lot of guys like me that will actually buy into this and they can actually insert themselves into the story. So I spoke to a mate of mine. She just recently published a book and got some advice of her publisher and he absolutely loved the concept and the idea. And yeah, I just, I finished the book, got it to him, he edited it and here we are. It was very much about um, 
once I realized that there was something in there, it's it's more about helping others through my story than anything. Yeah. So your target audience for the book is men working in trades. So um, how do you see the book helping, um, you know, men in, in the different kind of trades professions? Yeah, it's even like I'd extend that past trades a little bit too, sort of army, firefighters, truck drivers essentially as well. Like, um, So it, just mas- masculine industries. Yeah, that really masculine, dense sort of industries. Yeah. Um, it, it's more of a story that guys, and this is the feedback that I'm getting, it's more of a story that guys go, ah, that's given me the space and the time to actually think about my life. And it's that real mirror moment to go, okay, well, let's have a look in the mirror myself and see the burdens and and the baggage that I'm carrying that I can actually go and give it to somebody else and lighten myself up. So that's the feedback I'm getting. Guys aren't in this industry, aren't great at checking in with themselves. And I guess it's that that piece to allow them to do that. Yeah, and I guess um, uh, like, I understand the the male experience. You know, often we're reluctant to ask for help or um, to say, oh, "I'm gonna, I need to lighten my load." You know, it's like taking on that responsibility for whatever reason. Um, yeah, so having that chance to self reflect and think about, yeah, uh, other things other than you know taking on masculine stereotypes um, is probably helpful, right? Well, we don't necessarily. We've never been taught a one and yeah. and b. We don't put out normally put ourselves in the right space, right? So you're not going to get out of the pub with your mates and be vulnerable because most of the time it's shit talk about footy or what you did 12 months ago. That's not the right time of the space, especially around alcohol, right? So, you know, guys aren't going to go and do that in, in the pub, whereas they go to a yoga studio or a men's group or something like that. It gives them the time and the space to be vulnerable. And I think... Guys don't give themselves enough credit. They are fantastic at being vulnerable because we're very solution-based. So if you give them the time and the space to do that, they are looking for a solution to what's holding them back. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, definitely been accused of that before, rushing into solution mode rather than fully listing. (laughs) Who has it? <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. Like, so my wife comes to me and uh, it gives me a problem. I'm like, all right, do this. She's like, because because she's an idiot and can't think of the solution for herself. I don't want to put that out in the air. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, my wife is very intelligent. I know. And I've learned over time. Yes, I just need to bite my tongue and listen. Yeah. Empathy, o- almost Empathy. something you'd learn as a psychologist, right? <sighs> just that the act of. There's a reason, reflective listening. There's a reason I didn't want to go into that field of psychology. Yeah. I like solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Dan, how, how's the book been received then? Yeah, look, amazingly. I It's only been out sort of eight, ten weeks. Um, really only had one keynote so far, but uh, especially, you know, mates. And I did give the book to a builder mate of mine on site. He read it in one night rang me three days later and said, Dan, I read your book and I actually went and booked in with a psychologist and I, I feel a lot better. Thank you for that. Um, after the keynote speech uh, last Saturday, I had a guy in his sort of early 50s come and sit across the table from me and just burst into tears. Um, you know, we went outside, had a really great chat and it is that piece to start the conversation for guys to actually go and start to do something. Um, whether it be psychologists, psychiatrists, where that sort of goes, that's that's the path that they go to. But it's really about that reflection and, and start the conversation piece. Yeah, and as you say, you know, um, it's these aren't skills that are either taught either by um, or in schooling or formal education settings, and often they're not role modelled or taught to us by other men in our lives either. So, um, yeah, no, it sounds like you've found a real important gap to uh, to fill. Yeah, well, like, especially, and I look at my own sort of life too. My father, he's the son of a, a, a German um, World War uh, II. He, he escaped after after the war and sort of he, that's very much ingrained in, in grandpa, right? So that, and that's the environment that my father grew up in. So it's very much generational lines of not really talking about things. So I, I really struggle with that because... I am an empath, but I also love to talk and and really hash things out. So 
I guess that's at 24 when I had my crossroads moment. But for me, it's, it is about allowing yourself to open up and, and really check in with yourself. Yeah, cool. It's something that I know that my old man really struggles with, even to this day. Um, people trying to get in and, and, and help, but it's just, it's a wall. And I think that's just environmental conditioning from how we grew up, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you're also a small business owner and an employer, as you've mentioned. Um, so I think what, what we'd really like to talk about here is, um, you know, sort of some practical um, strategies or approaches from your perspective as, as an employer, especially as an employer of men in a very masculine um, industry. So is it reasonable for small business owners to be involved in employee mental health in your view? Yes, definitely, but it can't be forced down their throat. Um, it's first recognition, it, it's perception, and then you definitely can plant the seeds. Um, but trying to kick someone's door down just doesn't work. So for me, it's making sure the guys, if they are struggling, they know they can come to me. Um, and that's basically by a vulnerable piece by me to say, hey, guys, this has been my experiences I've got it in a book that the globe can actually read. So for if, if I can be a little bit vulnerable, I, I sort of want you guys to be if you're not feeling 100% right. So um, it is making sure that it is a culture of checking in with the guys. Mm. And what effect does um, poor employee mental health have on a small business? Yeah, so I'll give you a bit of an example. I had, uh, this is very recent too, I had, had an apprentice He's a really great kid. I, I sort of know a little bit about his upbringing and it wasn't perfect, but he just kept stuffing up at work. And I got to the stage where I went, he's smoking pot. He has to be like just the, his demeanor. Um, but there's nothing I can do about it at that point other than asking him about it. And it was a denial, which is fine. Um, I, I can't specifically target a drug test to him. Um, but I knew that time would allow me to catch it. So he fortunately sent me a text message that was supposed to go to a mate of his. Um, so there was a bit of a sort of gotcha moment, but it allowed me to, to bring him into the office the next day and, and, and show him the two paths of either I could let you go now, mate, and I don't know if that's going to lead to further addiction, unemployment, where that's going to go. Or the other piece is I want to pay for you to go and see the guy that I saw to, that helped me change my life. I'm going to drug test you in six weeks and we're going to put that formally. Um, and then I want to mentor you through the rest of your TAFE and, and the rest of your trade. And tears were in his eyes and it was a piece of, you know, that real fork in the road moment for him. And he, he actually said to me, I've never had anyone mentor me like that before in my life. And, you know, I'm not saying that everyone has to put up with drug use in their business or whatever it may be, but it, it really is about perspective and what may be underlying why your employee is not performing. That's a, um, a fantastic um, response that you you were able to do there, and I think um, probably quite unusual um, from from an employer, um, and especially you know where you are working in a high hazard um, environment. You know, there's a lot of risk there um, to you as a business owner, um, and I think that um, that for me is an example of performance management done well, or you know a performance improvement plan, if you like, done well. A lot of organisations use it as a way to um, essentially provide grounds to fire somebody. Um, but I think what you've done there is actually um, how a performance improvement plan should be done, which is actually here are the steps that we're going to take to help you get sort of past this and, and, um, and, and yeah, be able to succeed um, in, your, in your career. So that's fantastic. Well, it's a double-edged sword too, right? So now I've got an employee that I know has my back 100%. He turns up on time. He's the first one to, you know, fly the laser plumbing flag, which is absolutely amazing. It, it has to be done well too, that um, 
for lack of a better term, the employer can't be taking the piss out of either. You have to make sure that ultimately, yes, you have to protect yourself from the business, but you really do have the ability to change someone's life, which ultimately helps you in the business as well. So you have to wholly and solely want to help that person. And the byproduct really is the business gets help too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now the cultural impacts are, are massive, but um, I guess to that point, uh, if you're an employer or say a line manager, uh, how might you notice that an employee is struggling if they don't come and tell you themselves directly or, you know, accidentally text you instead of their mate? How do you it's, pick it up? It's all about those little things, right? So were they normally really on time and are they now getting to work five minutes, 10 minutes late? Is it that their diet's really changed? Um, it's all about those little subtle changes that people that I guess are experienced in this will pick up a little bit more, but it's looking at a person and, you know, are they putting on weight? Are they, are they turning up in ripped clothes? Whatever it may be, there's something underlying as to why. And I, I know you can't turn around and go, mate, your clothes aren't really that great for that's as an example, but it's that monitoring piece to start to gather your information to say, hey, look, you're not what you were. Is there something going on? And that's the conversation that starts everything. Yeah, and I think that's typical uh, or similar to the formula that I, you're okay talk about. You know, you're not looking at your usual self. Um, let's let's have a conversation. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and have you got any other examples of that where you've been able to you know identify someone who you know they, they weren't being their normal self? And you were able to have a conversation with them and that was able to raise some, you know, external issues that maybe you wouldn't have gotten out of them if they, if you were just waiting for them to disclose to you. Yeah, definitely. Like, as I say in my book, I, I think I was sort of undiagnosed with ADD. Um, and I really recognize that in one of my guys, but he's being treated for it. And to understand how some of you guys think. So with him, He's very erratic. He'll go and start a job here, start a job here, start a job here, start a job here, and not really finish anything. With him, it's very easy for me to now turn around and realize, well, I know how you think now. You think really well off lists. So everything that I do for him is in lists. Some of the other guys, and it used to frustrate the hell out of me, I would have a conversation and they would repeat the whole entire conversation back to me. And being a business owner, at times you can be time poor. So to have, to have a five-minute conversation relayed back to you used to get me frustrated. But now it's that realisation piece that, no, that's just them understanding and you actually get that better product because you're not getting 56 phone calls off the back of it. So um, with the guy with, with ADD, um, he was struggling a little bit with his ability to work and we really nutted that out together. Again, I went and paid for him to go and see somebody just in case there was anything underlying that was really affecting him. But it's really about me communicating to them how they need to be communicated to. Yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, listeners wouldn't have seen it if they're not watching the video, but Joel had a very knowing look when you're describing the symptoms of ADHD. She does have a suspicion that I might have it myself. I and didn't I think, notice that smirk. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of similarities between you and me, mate. There's uh, that constant restlessness, right? There's always something else to do. Um, and now I understand why you wrote a book. Although being ADHD would be pretty hard to sit down and actually do that. It's funny. The the three weeks or four weeks it took me to write the bulk of the what? book. What? You, you did it in... <laughs> okay. Hyper That's focus. a hyper-focus, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> was like so cathartic. Yeah. yeah. It took me a year to go back and edit it because yeah. that was the frustration piece for me. So, yeah, I get it. Yeah, Joel and I were talking about that over lunch just as well, actually. It's about, yeah, I love starting projects, um, but I like then handballing it at a certain point going, okay, now you finish it. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't have anyone to finish mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was like my dissertation yeah. for my uh, master's uh, thesis, and that's why I, held, I hung on to that for two years until I had to get it in or start my master's again from scratch, yeah, which I wasn't going to do. Ugh. Deadlines are good for people with ADHD. Oh, they're great. True. The best. <laughs> um, 
So I think you've you've given us some examples already, but what I wanted to talk to you about is this idea of reasonable accommodations. Um, so, you know, where people do have, you know, if they've got a physical injury and that's, you know, we know that if we're, um, especially in a manual role, um, you know, it's altered duties, light duties, whatever that might be, and we make those accommodations for them so that they can still continue to be at work while they're recovering. Um, this idea of um, providing accommodations for people who have a, a mental illness is um, a bit of a earth shattering um, idea for a, a lot of uh, a lot of businesses. Um, so I'm interested in um, your thoughts or examples, um, and you, you've given us some examples there. But yeah, what what can small businesses do for employees who are experiencing poor mental health? but can, in sort of keeping them at work or at least keeping them partially at work to help them um, recover? Yeah, so it's, it, it is a little bit about a, a flexibility piece. So um, within the last little bit, one of my guys broke up with a, a long-term girlfriend and that had a huge effect on his mental health. There was some pretty bad factors around the breakup and a best mate of his and whatever else, but... So not only did he lose a best mate, he lost his missus at the same time. Um, it's all about really being flexible. So it was, I understand what you're going through. Do you need a day off? Yes or no? No, I'd rather be at work because it takes my mind off things. Okay. But if you're at work, it cannot affect your job because it affects clients. So how can I best support you? And that was really about making sure I had an apprentice with him at all times. Um, giving him jobs that I knew that he had the capacity to do. Um, don't go and give him something super intricate because he's in a frustration piece at the moment. And then again, making sure that he's booked in to see somebody, whether it was the guy that I saw or, or who that might be to make sure that he is actually doing something well. And then I introduced about four years ago, um, a mental health half day. So if something slipped in, in you and, and you just need to have a half day no questions asked but you have to provide a, you have to provide a photo of you either in a meditation piece going for a walk on the beach going to the gym whatever it might be it can't be hey i'm knocking off half the half day friday to go to the pub with the boys that doesn't work so that introduced that to him he he fully took that on board and and did go and just go to the gym on a friday afternoon and just sauna do what he wants to do so it's really about that supporting piece because ultimately and as you as you alluded to before we were talking it it's there's such a labor shortage at the moment you don't want to lose one of your really great guys um because he has to step away i'd rather be there to support and if it takes him a week or two or three to get right i'd rather that than have to go through the recruitment process losing him because he okay, he, he may have pissed a client off in that two to three week period, but the relationships are that good with our clients that they understand, um, that's that's the piece. It's, it's really about that flexibility and patience. Yeah, so that's um, that sort of leads me on to the next question there around, um, you know, benefits for your business when you're able to make those types of accommodations and it sounds like, um, yeah, sort of retention, obviously in the, in the job shortage or the, um, not job shortage, um, labor shortage, labor shortage. Yeah. Um, at the moment is obviously a big one. Um, and yeah, are you better off having somebody who's at 70% or having nobody? The devil, you know, rather the devil you don't kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, and look, they're not going to stay in the 60 to 70% long, right? You, you can quite easily build them back up to the 80 or 90. And I think he is, 20 or 30 percent better than what than when he went through the breakup then he's probably 10 or 15 percent better than before the breakup because of that mentoring piece and he knows that i've got his back i've got his career he's after the breakup he's gone through it and bought his first investment property so now he's very hungry for the overtime and all that kind of stuff so he's getting more jobs done a day and that's benefiting the business as well so it's a double-edged sword again. He sees so much benefit, but I do too. 
Yeah, and what you really get there, um, and I think we've we've talked about this concept on the podcast before of psychological contract, where um, you know that as an employee, if you sort of go above and beyond, you expect that your employer is going to reciprocate, and that's sort of um, you've you've reversed that a little bit there, where as an employer, you've gone above and beyond, and then you're seeing that um, that your employees are now sort of rising to to meet that, and um, so you've got. Um, I think an increased level of trust there um, that they know that you've got their back when they need you to. And so you've got, a, you know, in, yeah, a much more loyal workforce and people who are um, probably more committed to um, step up and go the extra mile when your business needs them to, because they know that you're going to do the same for them when they need you to. Yeah. And like I had a, had a guy um, at the end of one of our projects last year, I know he was doing it quite tough. So I had some extra Coles vouchers in the in the drawer. So I just went and dropped them straight up to him and you know paid for shopping for a week or two for his family. And although he did end up leaving us, he's actually come back um, very recently. And, and he's, although he's a subcontractor, he's still one of the key members of the business now. Cause I know, I know him, I, I like him, I trust him, and he's got the same piece for me. Like he's gone out on his own to feed to, you know, to really feed his family, build his own business. But He's finding comfort back in being around me and, and, you know, me making sure that I'm feeding him the work, which means he knows he can feed his family. And it's, and it's that real culture piece, which I, I love. Yeah. So a, a lot of this stuff is, um, you know, cultural and good feels, which is hard to measure. But the other things that you alluded to, the benefits are like, you know, obviously if you reduce the turnover, you don't need to recruit again. So you're not paying recruiter fees. There's training fees, right? There's, you know, um, there's some downtime while you're training people up and getting them ingrained into your procedures and, and that sort of thing. And extra um, work on everybody else while all that's happening. Yeah, that's right. So the impact on your other staff. Um, so, yeah, even for the accountants out there, talking to you, Dan, um, <laughs> there's there's benefit, not this Dan, uh, the other Dan, um, chartered accountant. Um, he, yeah, no, th there are benefits obviously that you could actually put an ROI figure on as well saying, well, it makes a lot of business sense and it makes a lot of cultural and, 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 um, you know, moral sense to do the right thing by your employees. Yeah, of course. Like if, if you are getting a guy that you, when he's going through things, you may only get five hours billing out of him a day, mm. but now he's on and he's on song and he's eating the right foods. He's going to the gym and all that kind of stuff. So he's turning up, he's efficient and effective that might jump straight up to seven hours a day that i get to bill for him so it's definitely an ROI on that yeah yeah and then like you say you're forging long-term friendships trust uh and all the rest as well mm. so hey um dan this has been a really uh in interesting conversation um yeah Definitely, as Joelle alluded to, you are a unique guest, um, but I think you've got a really great perspective and I'm really hoping that our listeners um, enjoy this, this uh, new uh, perspective. Um, now, we, we talk with a lot of people who are aspiring to get into a profession where they're either, you know, working in the mental health space, being an advocate like, like you are, or a mentor, or even trying to um, work in the psychological health and safety space. Do you, do you have any words of um, uh, encouragement or advice for people who are, you know, trying to look at things maybe through more of a mental health lens in the workplace? I definitely think perspective is the, is the big one, right? So um, you've got you've got your own learned beliefs, you've got your own the way that you do things, and I think coming in with some patience and perspective will really help you go a long way in that field. Um, obviously the empathy piece comes in thing as well, not sympathy, but um, just making sure that you can see things from another person's point of view. Yeah. And I think you've actually um, in your examples demonstrated more than empathy. It's actually compassion because you then go out of your way to help people as well um, on their, on their road, mm. which I think is uh, important. So yeah, we, we talk about compassion of obviously being action orientated rather than just feeling people's pain and, and noticing how they're feeling. It's like, oh, I'm going to do something about that. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I guess the compassion side of things is, again, you need, you need, you need to make sure that you protect yourself um, mm. first too. Like you can't give and give and give if you've got nothing left in your tank. That's probably the really big one. And I've fallen into those traps, I guess, 
very early on. Now I, I know the boundaries. So I know when I can say, look, I, I can't help you any further. You need to go and do this or this or this. And that really protects me and my space as well. And it's not something that I did or learned straight away. Um, that's that's the big one too. Yeah, uh, being able to say no sometimes is actually a, a good skill to have um, and pointing people in the right direction rather than taking it on yourself. But we talk about that a lot with people who get into the profession. They've got such an interest and they're so um, aligned like values-wise to, to what they're doing and they find it so meaningful that they can burn themselves out if they're not, you know, filling their own tank, as you say. Yeah, yeah. a problem with anybody who's sort of in a a, a calling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you have some words of advice for small businesses who want to improve how they're managing um, work and mental health? Yeah, it's, it's definitely not something that you can change overnight. It's something that has to develop um, over time. But it is also about starting, just starting that conversational piece, making sure that you're doing those things with, if, if you're going to do an employee review, make sure that you turn up for them and you actually say what you're going to do. Um, checking in with the guys and making sure that you're aligned with and you can try and help their personal and professional goals because I think a lot of people now, especially in the time we're in, are very money driven. There are a couple of people that obviously aren't, but people are really money driven at the moment. So if you've got a pathway for people to actually get a pay rise or whatever it might be, actually execute it because you start to build that trust and they start to go, well, Dan says something and he actually follows through. So you start to get that buy in. Um, it'll start to change the culture of the business. The people that are in are definitely in and the non-culturally aligned people sort of start to feel that and will either kick up a stink or leave. Um, so that's really the, the piece for, for me to really start that, um, just to get buy-in. Yeah, fantastic. And Dan, um, one of the, the questions we ask all, I guess, is, you know, what are your hopes for the future of workplace mental health? But maybe, um, I guess, particularly in small businesses, you know, how would you like to see the future of workplace mental health play out? Well, uh, yeah, as I've said sort of before, small businesses and medium-sized businesses are the biggest employers in Australia. So I think we really hold the key to change massive amounts of people's lives in, uh, in the mental health space. So it is making sure that you're giving people a, a real comfortable environment to work in. And I'm not saying, you know, we all need to be like Google and give everyone ping pong tables, but a really nice workplace, you can help them with goals. And even if that's something that you don't have the skill set for, it doesn't cost very much to have somebody come into your business and, and help you with that side of things. So really making sure that there's that check-in piece, they've got a work-life balance that's the kind of piece that you really need as an employer um, and buy it from you guys, making sure they can talk to you and tell you if something's not right. If, you know, you're not the type of employer, if they crash the car, you're going to fly off the handles. Well, they might have crashed the car. That It is a problem, but let's fix it together. Yeah, yeah, terrific. Um, well, Dan, it has been a fascinating conversation with you and I really hope that, um, you know, people – pick up your book and give it a good read and um, hopefully get booked on some more keynotes as well. So you get to share your story that way. Um, Cause yeah, seeing that myself, it can have a really great impact if you've got a good story to share, to share that, um, you know, people can apply things from immediately. So uh, look, thanks again, mate, for your time and really hope uh, the best of success, both for the plumbing business and also your uh, burgeoning uh, authoring and, and keynote um, uh, profession as well. I oh, really appreciate it. It's not a hard read. It's written by a plumber, so you guys should be right to read it. Pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's right at my level then. Yeah. It is. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Well, thanks for that, mate. Well, uh, listeners, that brings us to the end of this episode. Um, remember, we do video these when we uh, interview our guests, so you can check that out on the Flourish DX YouTube page if you're interested. Um, while uh, you're online, if you go to LinkedIn, you'll also find that we'll take snippets of this as well as our other uh, guests and put them on our Flourish TX LinkedIn page. And then Joel and I are like on LinkedIn way too much. So uh, we basically live there. Yeah, it's a bit creepy because um, people come to our house all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that was a weird turn. Yeah, it was. 
um, slide into our DMs. You know, but no, feel free to slide into our DMs. Well, and that's what and Dan can, did. And, yep, he did. He did. And look, <laughs> and he, he ended up being a guest on the show. And here he is now talking to all of you. Exactly. So if you've got a guest and you want to be like Dan and, and share a story, then, um, you know, please reach out to us and continue the conversation. Uh, but that's it. Listeners, we'll catch you next episode. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on psychological injury prevention, follow Flourish DX on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast at www.psychhealthandsafety.com.